Welcome to Hunt for History. This week we are on location at the Hermitage, which is on the Oyster River, and I know that you're going to hear the Oyster River as it just kind of rambles down the side of the building. Our guest is Father Charles Brandt. Charles, it's really a delight to be out here, and I know that our viewers are going to be very interested in hearing about the history of the Hermitage. Well, you're very welcome, and uh, you commented on the, the beauty just of the drive coming in. Yeah. It, um, it's a wonderful introduction to the Hermitage. You know, we're, we're sitting here, and uh, in absolute solitude, and just a few thousand feet away, there's a big subdivision, but we're absolutely unaware of it because mm -hmm. we're surrounded by trees and and God's nature and beauty. We're not really aware of all of this uh, busy civilization around us. Now you came here to have a contemplative life. That's right. Uh, <clears throat> you know, um, I think even as a child, you know, my hero as a child was Henry David Thoreau. And Henry David, uh, in the 19th century, he went to Walden Pond and he wanted to see what life was all about. That was his purpose in going. Mm -hmm. And he felt that, that most people were living quiet lives of desperation. Those were his words. So he went there to really to experience what the real meaning of life. And uh, as I say, he was kind of my childhood hero. And I always wanted to live some, some kind of a life like that. And I, as a Christian, I would read, well, you know, pray always. And mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you do that? How can you pray all the time? It was always sort of a puzzle to me. And then later, I became an Episcopalian or an Anglican, and I entered seminary as an Anglican and in Wisconsin, and I was ordained a deacon. And then I went to England because I wanted a life of prayer, a contemplative life. I wanted to pursue this life of praying always. And I didn't really know exactly what that meant, but there wasn't anything in North America of a contemplative na nature in the uh, Anglican Church. So I entered a community up in the West Riding of Yorkshire, the community of the Resurrection, and they let me, it was kind of an oratorian type, you could do what your, whatever mm -hmm. your attray was, you could follow it, so they let me pray a lot. And then while I was there, I was ordained to the Anglican priesthood by the Bishop of Wakefield, it took a lot of sort of legal maneuvering because I was an American citizen at mm -hmm. the time. So then I was ordained, and, but I still wanted this life, and so I came back, I, I realized that really wasn't where I belonged, so I came back to um, America, and I settled as an Anglican hermit in um, New England. And I was a chaplain at Kent School, just a few uh, miles away. And then from there, I went to the Anglican Benedictines in Michigan and became an Anglican novice monk at a Benedictine house. And it gradually became clear to me that I should probably I should become a Catholic. And you know, it's interesting. Uh, while I was at this house there. I, somebody said, you should read The Golden String by Bede Griffith. And The Golden String, he take, it, it, it's, a, it's a line from Blake. He says, I give you the end of a golden string, mm -hmm. wind it into a ball, and it shall lead you through a narrow gate that passes through Jerusalem's wall. That's not exactly it, but very close to it. So I read this book, and it's really about his own conversion. He knew uh, C.S. Lewis at Oxford. He was his tutor. And after he graduated, he and a group of his friends lived, went into part of Suffolk and lived sort of a, a life just off the land, trying to get like something like Thoreau, getting to mm -hmm. what is life really all about. And they begin to read the Bible, just as literature for, in the beginning. Then they realized there was more to it than literature. So then he was, Vaji be, became practicing Anglican, and then he was received eventually into the church became a monk at uh, Prinich Abbey, and he always wanted to go to India uh, to take the gospel to India. And anyway, I read this book, and there are two books in there. One was uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman's book, Apologia Pro Vita Sua, talks about his conversion, or his life, because somebody's saying, well, just what does Mr. Newman really mean? And so he wrote the book in just a matter of days to tell people what he really meant. And the other book I read, which he recommended, was Bede's Ecclesiastical History. This was written in the sixth century. Yes, and Bede, I've read it. Have you? Yes. And Bede was a monk, you know, mm -hmm. a Benedictine monk. So on the basis of that, I thought, well, you know, I've been studying this mm -hmm. faith for about seven years, and I really should become a Catholic. So I ended up in a studying in a Benedictine monastery in Oklahoma, 
just as a, a layman. Mm -hmm. My bishop gave me permission. And they had a bookbinder there. And that's where I learned bookbinding mm -hmm. while I was at this. You know, Benedictines have this sense of crafts and mm -hmm. culture. In mm -hmm. fact, in the Middle Ages, most cities well, were built around. Go, go uh, back a long way. Back to the 6th century that's with right. Benedict. So then I was received into the Catholic Church. And I entered a Cistercian Benedictine house in Dubuque, Iowa. And I was there for seven years. And uh, before I went there, I went to visit uh, Thomas Merton, famous spiritual writer at Gethsemane Abbey, before I went there. And he said, he said, well, don't come here to the Abbey. He said, we'll make you a good monk, but not a good contemplative. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the place was really very busy. And even though it's a, they, don't, they didn't speak, and they had a big office, they said, for hours and time in, in, in chapel, they had very little time just to practice silent, mm -hmm. quiet, contemplative prayer. So he was sort of looking for something. And later he went to Bangkok, and uh, he was sort of, he actually did become a hermit about the same time that I did at Gethsemane, living on the grounds. But then he went to Bangkok, and he gave a conference, and he was electrocuted there. But he was a... Uh, so I, Abbott said, well, why don't you write to Thomas Merton? And this is that very letter that he answered. He, this is his answer. And he says, well, you know, if you do become a hermit someplace, and this is his mm -hmm. signature, Father Lewis's signature from Gethsemane, mm -hmm. and you'll probably find it pretty rough going. But uh, he was a great inspiration, Thomas Merton, to me to come here. So I finally got permission to come out to Vancouver Island on the Solom River, where the hermits were. And uh, it's such a small world, isn't it, when yes. you think about it? Yes. So now, how long had the hermits been here before you actually okay. joined them? Before I came, they, I came in March of 1965, and they had come in August of 64, so that's just a few yeah. months before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. Uh, I just have a, a little article here, just to maybe I don't, you can see some of the pictures. This was our picture of our founder. Uh, Jacques Vinandi, and Jacques Vinandi was an abbot of a famous Benedictine house in Belgium, Luxembourg, and as a young monk, he wanted to become, he wanted to be a hermit, he wanted a contemplative life, so his father, who was sort of a wealthy businessman in the town nearby, said, well, first of all, try this abbey that's right here on our doorstep, mm -hmm. so he did, and he was very intelligent, they sent him to Rome to study, he was a scholar, and then when he retired, he still had this desire for the real contemplative eremitic life. So he went to Martinique for a time just to fill in for a prior there. And, you know, people who live the religious life, they know what's going on in all the world, really. Mm -hmm. If you want good accommodations, you go to Paris, mm -hmm. go to a strictly enclosed order, mm -hmm. and they'll tell you, well, you, this is a good <laughs> hotel to go to. They know what's going on. Uh -huh. so, so the monks all over the world, they knew that Jacques Vinandi mm -hmm. had gone to Martinique. So several got permission to join him, and uh, then they decided that wasn't the place for a hermitage, so they went to Texas. And to find solitude in Texas, they would have had to purchase a section of land which mm -hmm. they couldn't afford. So one of the members uh, was a doctor, an MD, uh, Opiso was he, Dr. Opiso. And uh, he said, well, there's Vancouver Island, you know, it has a Mediterranean <laughs> climate. <laughs> So they, t for the, so Father John and Father Vinandi came to Victoria, and they spoke to Remy, Bishop Remy de Rol, and you know Be Remy was the youngest bishop in the Catholic Church at the time in Canada, and he's he was very avant-garde, open to many many things, very open person, and he's, he's Belgique himself, you know, his family mm -hmm. even Winnipeg, Southern Winnipeg, Manitoba is, is a Belgian colony. So, they, in fact, they say if you want to be a bishop, you have to be, a, in Manitoba, you have to be a Belgique. So, uh, so he welcomed the hermits, mm -hmm. and we, we established what we call a pia unio, which is kind of a contract. I'll accept you, and you accept me. And uh, it wasn't an official, stable, permanent, everlasting foundation. And so they came looking for land, and there was a real estate man in Victoria who said, well, there's some property up on the Solom River. So they took a look at it, and right across from the old town of headquarters. And so that's where they settled, and they got uh, a donation from a, a, a benefactor in uh, mm -hmm. Wisconsin, bought the land, and 100 acres, and lived right along the Solom River there. So uh, when I came, they were sort of beginning to get established. 
And I was quite surprised because I, I learned that you had to not only earn your own living as a hermit, but you also had to build your own hermitage. And so that was quite a challenge. You hadn't done that before? Uh, well, I, uh, no, I really don't think I really had. I was a, a, an officer in the Air Force. I earned my living for a short time doing that. I never really had a, a job. I've, mm -hmm. I've been studying all my life, various places and so forth. So I had to earn my living. And um, so I thought, what better way to do it than bookbinding? And mm -hmm. I had a few tools and some monks at Lafayette. I wrote to them and they said, well, we have some extra equipment. So they sent it to me. And I set up a little bindery there on the Solon River in my hermitage. And uh, this would have been sort of the end after I'd built my hermitage mm -hmm. during that year of 65. And you actually still have that at the, as part of the building that uh, we're at today. That's right. It's that old part of the hermitage there. Mm -hmm. In fact, we were looking at some of that equipment when we were downstairs in the basement, that guillotine and that uh, backing uh, mm -hmm. machine that, that was given to me by the uh, monks of Lafayette in Oregon. And then later I was accepted as one of the hermits, and, and you're, you're voted in. Mm -hmm. And the bishop had said, well, if you eventually are accepted by the hermits, I'll, I'll ordain you to the priesthood. And I'd always wanted to be a priest, a Catholic priest. And so I was elected. And so I was ordained then on uh, in Canadian Martyrs Church in Courtney on November 21st, 1966. And I just had, this is my uh, certificate of ordination. And it's signed by uh, Remy, mm -hmm. Bishop Remy Duroe. And it's interesting, he says that um, ordained as a diocesan priest for the Church of Victoria. His pastoral assignment is to serve the people of God as a priest hermit in according with the decrees of erection of the statutes of the hermits of St. John the Baptist approved February the 2nd, 1965. So these are the statutes. And um, so that was something. And this was written up in the, uh, in the columns. Well, I, I thought it was interesting that it had been 200 years since such a, a designation had been made to have a hermit priest. That's right. It was quite an unusual precedent. Mm -hmm. As I say, uh, Bishop Remy was quite mm -hmm. open. Avant-garde. Yeah. <laughs> Avant-garde, yes. And this just shows some of the uh, things like, uh, this is actually my mother giving her my first blessing as mm -hmm. a priest and picture the hermitage and uh, the ordination. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was quite a exciting exciting time for me. Well, and it was a very exciting time even within the church, wasn't it? Because this was the time of Vatican II. That's and, right. And Pope so John and uh, John Paul, mm -hmm. Pope John, and he said he wanted to open the windows of the church to let in a little fresh air, mm -hmm. and which was wonderful. And, you know, I know that uh, just kind of an, on an ecumenical ground, I, you're a Lutheran and I'm a Catholic, and people say that, you know, had... Uh, Lutheran lived the time of Pope John, or Pope John lived the time of Lutheran. Perhaps there would never have been a Reformation. That's right. Because I believe that. Do you? Yeah, you know, I do too. It's just that it seems like it was partly political, and certainly the church, uh, not the church as a whole, but uh, the, uh, this well, the, business the of indulgences of is, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, very difficult to understand. I can understand Lutheran's opposition to selling of indulgences. That was the thing that really upset him. I think. Oh yes. And, uh, and the church apologized for, for that kind of um, thing today. But I, I do think that it might, might never have happened, you know. And the uh, I think course of history would have been <clears throat> completely changed. That's right. But, you know, I think today we're, we're moving back towards uh, unity. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the various Christian bodies are, are moving back again. And it's interesting, you know, I plan now a trip to India. I mentioned B. Griffith. Mm -hmm. And this is his latest book. And it's called The Marriage of East and West. And he went to India, and he said he went there to discover the other part of his soul. He's, and I just, I'd like, may I just read just one little yeah. paragraph? He says, we in the West, we're living from one half of our soul, from the conscious, rational level. And we needed to discover the other half, the un unconscious, intuitive dimension. And he said, I, w I went to India because I wanted to experience in my life the marriage of these two dimensions of human existence, the rational and the intuitive, the conscious and the unconscious, the masculine and the feminine. I wanted to find the way to the marriage of East and West. So he went there looking for a, a far greater unity. And, you know, just recently the Holy Father has said that we should study these Eastern religions and we should can benefit from them because, you know, they were practicing 
uh, a type of monastic life, contemplative life, far before, long That's before right. Christ. And, uh, and we can benefit from their great discoveries in the East. So I really look forward to, to going to the East and spending two months. I'm leaving in October, mm -hmm. and I'm going to southern India, uh, a place called the state of Tamil Nadu, at uh, Shantivanam Ashram, uh, Satyananda. Uh, so it's a very exciting uh, adventure and pilgrimage for me. Now, you know, you're, you're talking about all the things that you do, mm -hmm. and yet to me, when I think of a hermit, I think of someone who is totally separate from the world. Who, who wouldn't be even doing TV programs, who wouldn't certainly be involved in the environment as you have. I mean, I can understand doing the book binding because that's mm -hmm. something that you would, uh, you know, do uh, as, as part of a contemplative lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I find that interesting, and I think our viewers too, because when we think of the hermitage, we think of people being so isolated from yeah. the community. Well, in a sense, I really am isolated, but I'm also in touch with what is going on. And I, I would say that my life is really sort of three-layered in the sense I'm, first of all, I think former's I'm concerned with uh, discovering this deeper level, this intuitive level of, of, of contemplation, uh, this union experience of God, uh, not only for myself, but for other people. And I teach Christian meditation or centering prayer. Uh, I give retreats from time to time, Victoria, Bethlehem Retreat Center in Nanaimo. And I may be giving a retreat in India, too. So I teach that kind of uh, contemplative prayer. Maybe we could say just a little more about that later. And uh, then I'm also interested in uh, the earth, uh, because I think God is present there. You know, the original blessing is God's creation of the earth 19 billion years ago at the great whenever it happened. <laughs> and uh, I think God, nature is, full. God is not nature, but God is in nature. And uh, we have to respect it, it's something sacred. And if I see something happening to that, well then I have to speak out, I have to say something about it. Uh, so ordinarily I don't look for things to do or action mm -hmm. to take place, but if something presents itself, I, I feel that from my life I have to say something, then. that's right, mm -hmm. out, of, out of love for God's beauty mm -hmm. and out of His earth. If we lose the earth, in a sense, uh, what, what have we got? We've that's got nothing, right. you know? That's right. Yes. So you said it's three layered, so what's the third one? Yes, well I, I guess I mentioned uh, myself and then others, I think that would be the second, <laughs> and then uh, the, the, the earth reaction itself. reaction to, yes. to, to God's world then. That's right, yes which, of course, anybody that is oh. aware of the environment is very aware of what you are doing for the environment. Great. And then, I, I'm sorry, and then the other thing that I, I didn't mention, or the third thing that's really important, is to conserve what flows from man's spirit. And that's the creative things that he does, such as works of art, his mm -hmm. writing, his books. That's why I do, I think that's why I really do conservation, why I have a conservation studio here. Mm -hmm. So it's all sort of conservation, mm -hmm. conserving my soul, spirit, spirit of others, uh, conserving the earth, and conserving what flows from man's spirit. Those those three three different layers. Now the other hermits were were they also involved in other projects that that would uh, lend themselves to their lifestyle? Well, you know, Father Vinandi, um, what did he do? Well, we had to make a living, and that was a very difficult mm -hmm. thing for most of us to do. It was a little easier for me, <laughs> but most of them had a really hard time. There's a picture of Matthew here, and you know, Matthew tried to do a little farming, and uh, he actually had a, had a goat, and here it shows him a picture of him feeding his goat. And he worked as a fire warden during uh, certain parts of the season to make some uh, living. Another uh, person did some pottery. Uh, Father Vinandi, quite a Latin scholar, he graded papers. And occasionally he would go out and take a service for Father Tunner. I would do that from time to time. I'd go to Cumberland mm -hmm. for a period of time. And take. And for a time, Bishop Remy asked, would you like to go down to Salt Spring Island? And the priest is uh, left there, and I need somebody temporarily. So I, I did that. As far as speaking out, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe Dunstan Morrissey. Uh, he was pretty much into social justice, and he would write about things. Mm -hmm. And for example, I, I do a little bit of writing. This is our 
Island Catholic News mm -hmm. and the picture of Bishop Ramy DeRoe and uh, Bishop Shepherd over on uh, Friendly Cove, uh, consecrating news thing. Goes. And this is a, an article I did on uh, called Rivers Forever. I like the way they sort of do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what it is, it's kind of an answer. You know, the forestry uh, groups have been having a program called um, Forest. Forest Forever. Mm -hmm. And I felt it was a bit one-sided because they don't talk about Samanid forever or rivers forever, mm -hmm. but just isolating on forest forever. And I don't think you can have forests in isolation. That's you right. have to look at the whole ecology, mm -hmm. at the whole picture. And that's what I tried to do. It's kind of a corrective thing to make people aware that there's more than just forest. There's the whole environment mm -hmm. that we have to be concerned about. So each of you then, when you were here and, and working as the well, as a working hermitage, I mean, the number of you, then each of you had a specific thing that you did. Did you get together daily to have meals, or...? Well, no, there was no communal life. Some of the big feasts, like the Feast of St. Benedict, or um, we would get together and have a celebration at Easter, uh, maybe Christmas, mm -hmm. a communal celebration at Father Venandi's hermitage. But I think the thing happened was that we, we did have a lot of meetings about property and taxes and about the car and and I think a lot of us felt that we were getting sort of back into a community again and and these were monks that had come from all over the world and they were formed monks they, they just weren't accidental mm -hmm. people off of the street but they've been living the Benedictine or Cistercian contemplative life for years and they wanted to go off into the desert and that's kind of a, a natural law it was recognized by Benedict that after a time you go off into the desert having lived the communal life mm -hmm. and go off and sort of enter into hand-to-hand -hand combat with Satan or to enter into deep prayer in the desert. So then we came and we found out it was it was kind of a community life and we wanted to get so we talked to Bishop Remy de Roe and he said well if you can find a piece of property someplace you can live as an individual mm -hmm. hermit and so we began to do that so we began to move to various places and I went around and I found a number of places for the other hermits, like on Hornby I found a place and the Savoys offered me a piece and then down on um, the island off of um, Salt Spring, I can't think of it right now, not Pender, but there's a little island there. Mm -hmm. And up at Port Alice and down at Nanaimo and Donald went down to uh, live on the Gogo's property and Bernard went to Hornby and. Uh, somebody else went to Port Alice and mm -hmm. so forth. So we sort of found a place and I came to the Oyster River and I wanted to live on a river because I thought that was really important. That sound, it's the movement to the river mm -hmm. and it's a very spiritual thing, a river. Mm -hmm. and the it water speaks, always is. It speaks to you. I mm -hmm. always hear this. It's never out of my uh, sound of mm -hmm. my ears. Now, you, it was interesting to me that you had gone to P. Leo Anderton's company to uh, to do this. Yes, you know, I don't know why I, uh, why I went to him. I guess, I, uh, I think we were talking about this before, and you said that he might have been a member of the parish. I, di I didn't remember that. That's probably the reason I did go mm -hmm. to him. And I went in and I said, I'd like to have find something on a river. And so finally, one of his agents said, well, we have a, found a piece on Catherwood Road, and that's where we are now. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking in that, coming to this clearing, and perfect spot for Hermitage, mm -hmm. you know? And I knew that was a spot. And it was too expensive, I couldn't possibly afford it. And then I found out there were two lots, and I was able to, because I was working as a technician near my Hermitage mm -hmm. for the Federal Fisheries, we set up a hatchery just mm -hmm. 200 feet from where I was, mm -hmm. I had a little bit of money, and so I was able to, to get Wait, this piece of property. Because you are a biologist. That's right, I was trained at Cornell as a biologist, just, yes. So everything fit in. It was all, all in the sort of the pattern so that you would end up here on this piece of property. It seems that way, doesn't it? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. everything, as, as we've spoken before, everything, all the crafts that you've learned, all the other things, it just, everything seemed to be dovetailing in so that you would be able to be here for, for your contemplative life. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful privilege. You know, uh, I'd just like to, if we have a moment, mm -hmm. a little bit about, you say, what is the hermit mm -hmm. life? And the hermit life or the contemplative life is really living a life of prayer. I said that I was always sort of seeking, how do you pray without ceasing? Like St. Paul says, to pray without ceasing. And Jesus teaches us, well, you know, to, mm -hmm. to enter into your closet and pray. And um, in the fourth century, I was talking about John Cassian, who went to the East to discover a teacher to pray, and he met the abbot Isaac, 
and it's contained in these conference of Cassian, and Benedict admonishes his monks to read these conferences. In it, he tells this experience with the abbot, and the abbot says, when you pray, take a, a single phrase, a single word, and just repeat it for the entire, entire time of your prayer. Don't think about it, but it's kind of entering mm -hmm. into a great poverty. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we do when we pray, at least that's what I do, and people who practice uh, centering prayer, they take a word like Maranatha, and they repeat it for the entire time of their prayer. They're not thinking, they're trying to get beyond their concepts, their imagination, their intellect, entering into a deeper consciousness and exposing themselves to the consciousness of the resurrected consciousness of Christ. And He is there. And all we have to do is get rid of all the clutter that surrounds us, you know. Get rid of our false self, enter into our true self, opening up ourselves to this consciousness of Christ. And that's what prayer is. It's the prayer of Jesus. You know, we've come to the end of our program, and I think that's rather a fitting close to it, as you explain exactly what it is to be in, in the contemplative life. Mm -hmm. Charles, I really appreciate you allowing us to come out to your place of, of quiet, of rest. I, it's been wonderful for me to be out here and away from the cares of the world, and I, I hope that our viewers get that sense of peace that we have found here. I'm certainly happy that you are able to share this piece. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We've been talking to Father Charles Branch about the Hermitage. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you again next week on Hunt for History.